Hey everybody, Nick Espinosa, your chief security fanatic here. And it is Sunday and we are doing breaches of the week, but we're talking about one very specific breach this week and that is 23andMe. And quite frankly, this goes beyond essentially what they stated because there is a history of privacy issues with 23andMe, but also with the basically the, the private genetic testing in general. So with that, regular breaches will continue on next week, but this is your very special breach. And essentially, this is also a deep dive. And so in that vein, now this week's deep dive is going to be on 23andMe. Now, let's get started because we've got quite a bit to cover. Now, as we go through the backdrop of their latest incident, we have to understand the framework that DNA testing has in terms of its issues. And so <clears throat> let's start at the basics. Why I won't get DNA tested. And I want to. Believe me, I would love to find long lost relatives, you know, all those kinds of things. I think it's really cool, but there's a lot of things as a cybersecurity and privacy professional that I just simply cannot abide by. And first things first, we live in the era of the hacker. Data breaches left and right. Understand how important your genetic code is to you. It is uniquely yours. And if it can be compromised and sold to, you know, basically through, through a hacker to a foreign government or something else, that's a huge problem. You can't change your DNA. And that's a huge thing. And a lot of people don't consider that. And we're going to dive into that. On top of it, corporations that have your DNA can be purchased and give your DNA to other entities. And we're going to go through that as well, because I think that's an important one, especially when it comes to 23andMe and some of their competitors. On top of it, here in the United States, our laws are antiquated. They're not that comprehensive. DNA privacy is not fully protected. And that's something we're going to be talking about as well, because these are loopholes that the 23andMe's of the world can actually exploit. And on top of this, you're not the sole owner of this. You own your DNA with your family. And so you may not go on and do 23andMe, but if you have a sister, a cousin, an aunt, an uncle, uh, some kind of relative somewhere that has done it, part of your DNA, part of your genetic code goes with them, which means we have to educate the world. And whether it's 23andMe or Ancestry or any one of these, that's a huge problem. And so there's obviously more to this as well. And for the record, if you're listening to this, whether it's a radio show, podcast, whatever it is, you can also flip over to the YouTube channel and get this because I am doing actually a live presentation, uh, you know, basically with slides and everything. So uh, you're basically going to want to see this. Now, first things first, as we look at this framework as to why I and many others that are of similar mindset simply will not get DNA tested, where does 23andMe fall into that? Well, let's go through that because I think it's a really important thing to understand. First things first, 23andMe in the era of the hacker. That's a huge problem. The current breach that we know about basically underscores a lot of those issues, but it also underscores shared responsibility. 23andMe absolutely has responsibility here, but so do the users that use that service that send them DNA. So here's what we know. In early October, 23andMe detected basically that intruders had gotten into accounts and uh, essentially were using recycled logins from other websites that had been compromised. It's like a password spraying attack. So for example, <clears throat> if you have a username and password and you're a person you know, of habit, a creature of habit, and you're using that password everywhere, you're using it for 23andMe, your bank, Facebook, Amazon, it's very easy to take that email address and that password and try absolutely everything that you can. And from there, you get in with a single username and password on a, on a computer from anywhere in the world. And we'll talk about that because that's another issue that 23andMe needs to address. And so while the attackers were only able to get about 14,000 accounts, according to 23andMe, these are 23andMe reported information. We don't have basically insight into if it was way worse than this. They may disclose that later. Maybe it's exactly this. I can't say, but we're talking about at the moment, 0.1% of their customers. But that basically means that anybody that is genetically linked and is turning the sharing on to say, yes, of course, let everybody find me. And you're attached to like 50 relatives around the globe that you've never met, but you're all connected. Now that information is also accessible. So those 14,000 accounts can lead to millions on millions of genetic information because we're all related in some way, shape or form, right? Go back far enough. <clears throat> and so basically 23andMe says, well, it's not us, it's on the users. They were using passwords that they're using at other places like Facebook, Amazon, whatever. And so, hey, it's not really us, it's them. But consider this, 
consider the issues of this shared responsibility for security, because what they can't deny is they've got weak security controls. If I'm able to log into a site that holds something incredibly valuable of mine, like my DNA, and they're not enforcing me to have some kind of multi-factor authentication, a simple username and password allowed them to get in, that's a huge problem in the same way that a bank wouldn't allow you to do that, right? And these attackers are not t going into 14,000 computers owned by these 14,000 people. They just have a simple username and password, and they're logging in probably from the other side of the planet or God knows where from a new computer unregistered previously into 23andMe for that specific account, and 23andMe is letting them right in. That's a failure in the security controls and the approach to security. And a lot of companies will do this under the guise of or logic of, well, we're going to make it as easy as possible for our users to gain access to the data. But we have to, in the era of the hacker, realize that it's a shared responsibility. And if you are running a genetic testing uh, you know, uh, uh, outfit, you should be enforcing things like multi-factor authentication. <laughs> On top of it, Clearly, the sharing between members, meaning I found my relatives and we're sharing information, was not granular enough for security. They didn't put controls on it basically at a granular level. So maybe I sure I am you know, sharing my information with that long lost cousin and that long lost cousin gets compromised or whatever it is. I don't have any controls uh, basically because I didn't get compromised that long lost cousin did. I didn't have any controls uh, that basically said, hey, if, if my long lost cousin attempts to download something, screenshot something, whatever that is, they're not allowed to do it. And I get an alert to say, hey, my long lost cousin is trying to download my data. There are things that you can put in place to detect these things, and clearly they're not baked in. On top of it, they don't appear to have any kind of effective intrusion detection or prevention, meaning what they've got is retroactive. They did spot it in October. They did start seeing unusual traffic, but why weren't they leveraging an artificial intelligence or a security information events management system that was more proactive than reactive, meaning we are starting to see this. You can also set up intrusion detection and prevention systems that say, hey, we have a known list of suspicious IP addresses. If any of those basically come up, they're going to be blocked automatically, uh, you know, or we're, hey, this person is typically geolocated in the United States and now suddenly they're logging in from Russia or wherever, <clears throat> maybe challenge them. You know, in the same way that that they every login, if you're registering a machine, should have MFA. And if the machine's not registered, then you're challenged for MFA no matter what. And these are things that you can put into place. And obviously there's more, but those are the, some of the big overarching things. I don't really impede users beyond, let's say, having to punch in an MFA code, but help to protect the user base. So this is a shared responsibility. And while they can point the finger to say, well, people are going to reuse their passwords and there's nothing we can do about it. And perhaps that's true. There are things they can do to help ensure security when somebody like that actually uses their system. And so these are things that, that they can obviously do and they're not. And I think that's a huge issue. <laughs> On top of it, Basically, they're giving outside entities access and also taking money. It's really that that's that, that simple. So with that, and wow, this totally got screwed up. But if you look at the timeline here, it's pretty, pretty amazing. So 23andMe is a publicly traded company. And what that means is people and entities around the globe can basically buy a stake. And they have. In 2015, a Chinese firm named Wu Shi basically made an investment in 23andMe. Now, 23andMe claimed, per the New York Times, that, that Wu Shi would not have access to this data uh, or genetic testing data. But also understand, if you're buying stakes in companies that are publicly traded, you get to vote. Meaning, if they buy enough or cut out in third parties, let's say, that are run by foreign governments. And for the record, China is pushing really hard to essentially have and be the most uh, innovative, if you will, in biotech. They are moving as fast as they can to collect DNA on everybody. And so why wouldn't they be investing in the 23s and Me's, especially if they're publicly traded? You know, these are huge issues. On top of it, you see in 2018, GlaxoSmithKline, $300 million stake. They did get to use genetic data. Now, 23andMe basically says all of this is anonymized data, but you can see P&G, Alain uh, Alam, I don't can't spell that, pronounce that, Pharma, Biogen, Pfizer, Genentech, they're all getting this data. 
data can be de-anonymized. And we are seeing just how effective artificial intelligence is at doing that. In the same way, your data in your iPhone can be de-anonymized through other methods such as fingerprinting. You know, so they're fingerprinting not necessarily your user and password and your apps, but they're fingerprinting your specific battery life, uh, you know, your capability, your storage space. All of these things start to build a profile around you. And unfortunately, if that is the case, and insurance companies are able to acquire that data through, let's say, de-anonymized means and match it to you, we've got a very serious problem, which we're going to talk about as well. And in 2021, Richard Branson, who is a citizen of the UK, basically created a partnership to go public and create a special acquisition company specifically uh, uh, to, to basically work with 23andMe, again, for an investment. And while we're fans of Richard Branson, he seems like a pretty cool dude. And, you know, he's out of the UK, which is a very friendly country to the United States. We're great allies. But nevertheless, he's still a foreigner. And so these are things that we have to understand are going on and they're going on quite well. And with that, We've basically got uh, um, <clears throat> the, the the laws here in the United States that really don't protect us fully. Now, you might have heard of GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act in 2008, but it has loopholes and has had loopholes since it was passed under the Obama administration. And I went looking and these have not been fixed yet. So GINA only applies to health insurance and employment. It does not apply to DNA testing. So 23andMe does not fall under GINA. And if you think, well, I have basically the Non-Discrimination Act, you know, for my data privacy, and I'm giving my data to 23andMe, they don't fall under it. On top of it, if an insurance company, I mentioned this in the other slide, somehow gains access to your DNA via another mean, they could actually indirectly match you and circumvent that law. And so that is another loophole. The ACLU has written about this and others. So that is a huge problem. And on top of this, Life insurance companies do not fall under GINA. And so they have the right to ask you if you're signing up, if you've done direct-to-consumer genetic testing, which means they can also decline coverage if you refuse, meaning I'm not giving my potential life insurance company my DNA. And they can say, well, then we're just not going to give you a policy. They don't fall under this. On top of this, and this is, has nothing to do with 23andMe, but a, a law passed in the state of New York allows the Facebooks of the world to give any information that you talk about uh, essentially to a, to a life insurance company if they ask for it in terms of health. So if you're using Facebook as a personal therapy group, putting out all of your medical things, and a, a life insurance company is getting access to that because Mark Zuckerberg will literally sell anything to anyone for the right amount of money. We know that. And you, if you are a longtime follower, you know I've been talking about that for quite some time. Life insurance companies now can screw you. This is a huge problem. People don't see this. And if your data is in there, and let's say you do discover some type of genetic abnormality, and you're otherwise fine, but you're a carrier for it, and that might script a life insurance policy, and they have the right to ask for this, and they, they are, now they can discriminate because they don't fall under GINA. That's a huge thing. Now, if you're thinking, well, <clears throat> we're talking about DNA, and it's healthcare. So on top of GINA, we also have HIPAA. This is basically the 1996 law that it protects patients' healthcare data. They do not apply to private DNA testing companies because they do not apply to direct-to-consumer products. That's a huge loophole in HIPAA as well. And I went looking because I knew there were talk. There was talk as I keep up with HIPAA compliance in my day job. I knew there was talk about well, they're going to do this because you've got basically. And this came out uh, due to the Roe v. Wade, uh, you know, basically being repealed. And there were a lot of women that were using, um, you know, trackers for fertility, to, you know, for pregnancy, all that kind of stuff. And now you've got states that can potentially that are banning abortion or heavily restricting it that can now legally subpoena that kind of information as it's not protected health. And that's something that has been bandied about. But obviously, we really don't have any changes. And so that also doesn't apply to 23andMe, meaning HIPAA doesn't apply. So you have basically a lack of privacy. And for the record, a lot of our privacy controls, especially those that relate to, to specific things uh, you know, that regard us, like our privacy by location, a lot of these laws were written in the Reagan era back in the 1980s. So we really need to step this up. And so if you are giving 
23 and me your information understand it is very possible that it can be breached understand that third party corporations including those that are foreign potentially have access anonymized or not and in the age of ai it can be de-anonymized we also have laws here in the united states that don't fully govern the privacy standards for your dna and so these are all the reasons why I won't do it. And these are a lot of the reasons why uh, many people won't do it if they're being informed about this. Now, my day job is, you know, compliance, cybersecurity, all these different things. I keep abreast of this kind of stuff, but most of the population doesn't. And while I am dying to do this until we actually have laws and rights here in the United States, I would be absolutely crazy to do it because my DNA will be given to GlaxoSmithKline and Biogen and a whole bunch of others. And if you've done 23andMe, your DNA already has. And that really sucks. And once that horse is out of the barn, you can't put it back in because your DNA cannot be changed. It cannot be altered unless you're completely irradiated, in which case you'll probably die. So, so you're stuck and it sucks. But for the rest of us that haven't, haven't done this, heads up, this is not going to be the only data breach or vulnerability that we see attacking an organization like this. We've seen others that have been hit. Ancestry.com got hit. My Heritage DNA got hit. A whole bunch of others have been hit. 23andMe is one of the biggest players in this game. And so it's not if they're going to get hit, it's when. And when your data is in there and it's being sold and it's not properly governed for your privacy, and now it's under attack, you've got a serious problem on your hands. And you can't say you haven't been told. And so that is your deep dive of the week slash breaches of the week, if you will. And thank you so much for watching and listening again. If you're if you're listening to this, you can go to the YouTube channel and see it. And please feel free to subscribe you know, to anywhere and all of that. And thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll absolutely we'll be back next week with breaches of the week normally. And with that, have a good day, everybody. Take care.